The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. Welcome into episode six of season five of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factory Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Thanks to Simon Treasure for the intro beat. And by the way, if any of you have any beats that you want to share, send them over to drumcandypodcast at gmail.com. We'll probably be swapping out our intro here halfway through the season. So now's the time to get your submission in. That is drumcandypodcast at gmail.com. I made this announcement last week, but in case you missed it, on January 23rd, that's a Tuesday night from 6 to 9 p.m., I'm going to be over at Hawthorne Drum Shop along with the folks at Hawthorne and some of the Drum Factory Direct crew, and we have David Throckmorton coming out to give a clinic. So it'll be 6 to 9. We're going to have some food, beverages, hanging out. The first hour or so, I'm going to do a drum tuning workshop, um, just some basic concepts of how to figure out what your drum can and can't do. And then we'll hand it over to David from around 7.30 to 9 to do his clinic. Um, it'll be casual. Bring your students, bring your friends. The shop will be open. We'll have some Drum Factory Direct stuff there. We'll have some Drum Candy t-shirts and that sort of stuff there. P.S. and some giveaways as well. So it'll be a good hang. This will be the first one. So again, January 23rd, the Tuesday night. And then we'll be doing these every six weeks or so. So look forward to seeing you there. All right, let's finish up our chat with Seb Thompson of the great band Baroness and the amazing post-rock band Trans Am and his solo electronic project Publicist. So let's get into it. I think we kick it off by talking about some of his influences. So let's go. Who are your biggest influences? I hear a lot of power groove based coming out of you. I wonder where that's coming from. I mean, so I'm a, I'm a little older, right? So it's like, it's gonna be really, two really obvious guys. I mean, the most obvious. Say it. I mean, Bonham, but that's everybody. Bonham, that's everybody. <laughs> right, but, he, but he's, he's in there for sure. And then Stuart Copeland is a massive Ah, player. there we go. And that's and, and they're very, they're totally dissimilar drummers. Yeah. They're almost opposites. But I, I like that, you know. Um, yeah, Stuart Copeland, for me, one of the reasons I love him is because normally you have kick, snare and the surface right uh, hi-hat or ride right and normally uh you have one thing is steady let's say you have like either quarter notes or eighth notes on the hi-hat or an ostinato and then the kick and snare can comp or mess around sure if all three instruments are comping it's not a beat any mm -hmm. right it's like a solo but Stuart copeland's thing is so most players, most rock players do the John Bonham thing. The surface, the hi hat or ride is totally stiff. And everything else is comping. Mm -hmm. Stuart Copeland does the, the other thing. The snare is always on two and four. And it's the kick and the ride or the kick and the hi hat that are comping. Uh, I've never and thought it's of really, that. It's really fucking weird. If you try to actually play his parts, you're like, what is. Like you listen, and you're like, oh, this is easy. Then you start playing, you're like, this is so weird. Yeah. And that I really, and it's still difficult for me, but I try to take that as an inspiration because we're so used to just like playing an ostinato or playing 16 stones or whatever it is on the hi hat or ride with a couple of accents. So sure, we throw some accents when we taste, but he's just like totally just jamming mm -hmm. on the ride. It's like a, this weird lead instrument. And, it's, and he has to keep the stare on two and four because if not, it's, it's just, it's not a beat anymore. But I think that's that's a really interesting thing he does. That's amazing. I've never thought of it like that, but you, that's exactly what it is. The snare is the anchor. The snare is, oh, it's, and it's like, and that's, I'm very much a back, really loud backbeat rim shot on two and four, like constantly. And it is a little bit of a prison, I have to say. And mm -hmm. I, I do get sick of it, but I just, it's like, I try to get myself out of it. I mean, there's like there's that one song on the new album where I consciously was like, no, we're not doing backbeat in two and four. It's the uh, shine. Do you know the song "Bad Reputation" by uh, Thin Lizzy? Oh yeah, yeah. It's that kind of thing. Uh huh. Right. With the snare on all beats, like like 
I mean, I hesitate to say this because it's going to sound. Do you know Advanced Drumming Techniques by Yanis Hahnemann? Of course. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was going to say, I was going to say, you know, like Motown. All right. Which, right. which he said, which he says in that, like, you know, Absolutely. like Motown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good callback. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but yeah. So I, I feel like I, I get a lot of that um, two and four thing from Stuart Copeland, and I also think when people hear Trans Am or other sort of crowd rock bands that do this Mordrick beat, they don't realize that's that's what the police does. Mm-hmm. It's do 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 do. It's a crowd rock. Beat yeah, you're right. With with like a shreddy drummer. Yeah. With a really heavy backbeat. That's what it is. And 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 uh, you know, eighth note pedaling on the bass. It's it's motoring. It's crowd rock, but with but a pop band. Yeah, I never thought of it like that. That's great. Yeah. What about your connection to metal? Because I don't I don't hear it i hear more of the hardcore and the groove yeah. and and yeah yeah some of the early like, Crojan conformity some of the more kind of groovy metal bands but right yeah i'm not i'm not a metal drummer and that, that's you, you reminded me of something that john basely said once that he thought that the cool thing about me and alan the other drummer the previous drummer is that alan was like a hardcore metal drummer that wanted to play like post rock or whatever and I'm like a post rock drummer that wanted to play metal, uh, <laughs> right? Somewhere you kind of interweave. <laughs> yeah. So like, so I, I definitely listened to a lot of metal as a kid. That's before I played drums. Like, I like my favorite band in my like fifth grade was Man. Right? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, back when they were good. Uh, <laughs> and then you know I loved uh, I loved really early. I mean I'm I'm 51, right? So. I'm talking early '80s here. I loved early uh, Queensrÿche was awesome, mm-hmm. and uh, I even liked the more glammy stuff like uh, Wasp, you know. And then uh, I loved uh, Sabbath and the, the first two Aussie albums, like mm-hmm. are like like the Bible for me. And then, even though he didn't play on those two albums, Tommy Aldridge is. is so uh, you know Tommy Aldridge? Oh yeah, just saw him last year. He's still kicking. He's so awesome, and <laughs> I don't play any—I don't play anything like it. But I love listening to him. I mean, maybe I, I saw one or two links. I don't play double kick, so that's a big thing. For him. But I saw one or two links from him. But but there's that solo Aussie album called "Speak of the Devil." Yeah, and and Tommy Aldridge plays drums on that. And as a kid, before I even played drums, I was like. It's like, what is this guy doing? This is awesome. You know? <laughs> so he's, yeah, he's so good. And and he also, unlike a lot of metal drummers, he hits so hard. Mm-hmm. He's like wailing on the yep. kid. And that that, is, that inspired me. <laughs> going, back, going back to Stuart Copeland, I got to say, I'll see videos on YouTube of people explaining like the Stuart Copeland beat or whatever. And they're like, yeah, you know, and I'm like, have you seen videos of them playing? <laughs> he has like his arms up here. He's like, and he's like dripping sweat and like freaking out, you know. But uh, so, and then when I was a little bit older, I got into uh, death metal. I liked uh, Obituary and Deicide, and then uh, before that, I I got into Slayer. Before that, I I never really liked Metallica because they were just like always kind of popular mm. even before, even before the black album mm-hmm. if you if you were like a nerdy music kid they were already popular yeah yeah even, even though they weren't mainstream yet you know so and you know when you're a kid sometimes you're like yeah that's <laughs> you know that's too Those popular are, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah right and come on especially metal people are definitely like that <laughs> and then uh i honestly when the black metal stuff started i didn't get it Mm. like I thought it was weak right mm. I get it now I understand like the mystique of it but back then I was like the drummers suck and it sounds like shit and I, I didn't get it right and then uh, I got into Meshuggah when Chaos Fear came out which I think is like the second or third album okay 
And that was that obviously blew my mind. Yeah. Cause that that came out of for me that came out of nowhere. And that was like, oh, we can take odd times and make them like totally headbangable and groovy. Mm-hmm. Like, what the hell? You know? Mm-hmm. And the funny thing is, Meshuga asked Trans Am to tour with them. Like wow. early early on. They were wow. they were fans. They like they were dude. <laughs> I don't want to blow smoke up my own ass here. <laughs> but Thomas Hockett mentions me in an interview saying like, okay, like he's not like the shreddiest drummer, but I like what he plays. Yeah. You know? So we couldn't do the tour because we had a previous obligation with another, with a band called Tortoise, which is one of the oh, yeah. Yeah. sort of preeminent post-rock bands. But, um, the hell I just lost my train of thought thought what were, we, what, what were we talking about do you think their fans would have embraced you the Meshuggah fans that's a good question probably not uh another band that is fans of Trans Am is Tool and we toured with them also that makes sense and so I in Trans Am I normally do like the mic sets between songs because it, it's a three piece and I'm like kind of in the middle in the front right and I just I would. I heard before. Tool always asks kind of weirdo bands to open up for them, and I heard that the crowd is kind of brutal to the opening mm-hmm. bands. So I, I would just. First of all, we just played. We didn't play any of the sort of like electronic Trans Am songs. We just played all the heavier stuff. And then after every song, I'd be like, "Okay, thank you. We're Trans Am, and we want to thank Tool." <laughs> like, between every song, I was like, "I'm not going to give them a chance. I'm not going to give them a chance to boo." Right. I saw Tomahawk open for Tool, and the crowd was pretty rough on them. Was exactly, rough. and Tomahawk Tomahawk's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And they're head, way heavier than Trans Am. So, were you ever into Iron Maiden? I only asked because of the single kick and metal connection. Like that, Nico. you know, that, that's a good question. I was always slightly into Iron Maiden. I was never like a diehard fan. I think, and the, I'm of the exact right age to be a fan. I think what didn't, one of the reasons I didn't like him is I always thought that metal should be like kind of scary. Yeah, same. I agree. Same. And I love Iron Maiden, but if you take away the artwork, there's nothing scary. No, not at all. Yep. It's it's really, I mean, it's way more, okay, when I say Man of War, I mean everything up to maybe Sign of the Hammer, right? <laughs> that's That's my era. And it's that even as cheesy and as goofy as that Man of War stuff is, it's way darker and scarier than any Iron Maiden. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I love Iron Maiden and I get it now. I get the really triumphant vibe and like, I, I, I love the, 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 the dual guitars and I love Nico's playing. And the funny thing is I have had to actually go back and revisit hit the albums that he plays on because of exactly what you just said because to get inspiration for single kick metal mm-hmm. so it wasn't it wasn't like it started with him i kind of have to go back and be like oh yeah that's like really famous single kick metal drum. let's, let's yeah. check it out again you know is yeah he the only one is he the only metal drummer that didn't do double kick up until recently i mean of course it depends how you define metal but i think you might yeah. be right pretty wild yeah, for me it was yeah. like if Guar exists, I don't want to listen to Iron Maiden. <laughs> like they kind right. of filled the same like cartoonish metal world. For right, me. <laughs> right, right. And uh, and now and now because we play all these festivals now with Baroness and we see uh, Iron Maiden and I'm fucking stoked. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited all day. I'm like I can't wait to see them. <laughs> but back in the day, I was like, this is like it's just too. It was like it's kind of sound like Christmas music. <laughs> it was you know it's like. <laughs> Is that the DC hardcore things? I'm from the, the that area, and oh, being, I'm in I'm in I'm in Bethesda right now. Okay, yeah. So having like Fugazi is my formative band. It kind of shit. Yeah, me everything. too. One hundred percent for me. I I came back to the area eighty nine when I finished high school, and I went to I think it's probably Fort Reno to see Fugazi, and I was just like, what the hell is this? Yeah, I had no idea. Yeah, I had no idea that punk could be so like could be played well first of all could have these like dub grooves yep could have this like 
insane combination of like anthemic and ferocious, you know, it was, it was awesome. And then bad, bad brains, obviously yep. Yep. big, big influence on trans Am and on me. Uh, those are the two big ones, the obvious ones. What was the kit you used on? Well, first of all, you still using your superphonic on everything? Is that your, your snare? Pretty much on everything. Yeah. Because that's the first thing I noticed on the new record. That snare sounds so freaking good. What is it? <laughs> yes, dude. Yes. I'll tell you what it is. No, I can't. <laughs> I mean, it, it is. Yeah, it's it's my 14 by six and a half super fun. It's just a classic. I've been playing. I have. That's probably my third one in the last 20 years. Okay. That's, every now and again, I also have like a maple one, same size. Mm -hmm. Maple Ludwig snare, same size. So if it's like something that has to be more sort of chilled out, you know, or more, I don't know, psychedelic or whatever. Do you tune on the same? Pretty much, pretty okay. much. But 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 I mean that's a, that's it's hard to answer because I, I I change the tuning every now and again depending on what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I mean I tune the, the the bottom really pretty high, and the top sort of high. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people do that. Um, is it just like a like if I would go to the store and buy a Superphonic, that's it, or you change the hoops out, or I mean nothing? No, totally off the shelf. And then I use I use the uh, I, I'm a I'm an Evans guy, Evans endorser. So I use the super tough dry as a little okay. vent holes. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm like I would give myself like a B plus on drum tuning. I'm not great. You know, so that that helps. Mm. It, it helps to get a little. Sometimes when you have a little too much ding, right? Yeah, yeah. You can you can crank it, and it will it, it it controls a bit of that for sure. Do you do much muffling for recording versus live? I do. I I pretty much have a, a moon gel, just one moon gel on on like really close to the rim. Okay. What was the rest? And of then the also, kit? what what for heads? What was the rest of the kit that you used on the record? For Stone? Yeah. So I, 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 I used a couple of different things. The main kit is a Ludwig Maple Classic. Mm -hmm. And so the main kit is 22, 12, 13, 16, 18. Sorry, 24. Did I say 22? Yeah, 24. 24. Okay. 24, 12, 13, 16, 18. And they're all... They're not... None of them are super deep. They're all like, uh, they're not shallow either, but they're not like power standard. Tones. Yeah. And then, and, and the kick isn't like pretty shallow, more sort of classic rock stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I also have a 22 that I use on some songs and I also have a set of rototoms. I've always used a lot of rototoms. And then, uh, and then I, I use, uh, Pisces, which like, I was always a little bit sort of punk rock about, gear like whatever works and also i was always a little bit sort of contrarian mm -hmm. right like there was there was like a, a long period of time in trans am where my kick was a kick drum a snare drum a hi-hat four roto toms and two stacks like china's with broken symbols on top and that was it no toms no ride no crashes because i was just like Guys, we've been playing the same kit for a hundred years. <laughs> like, what are we doing? Are we like in the fucking Benny Benny Goodman band? <laughs> what are we doing? Come on, guys! It was Krupa different. who codified it. You're right. <laughs> like, what the fuck is going on here? And you know, I, I've also always had, a, <clears throat> you know, a, a new wave influence and missing persons with Terry Bozio. Yeah. He, he did the Rototom thing, and I thought that was super cool. So, yeah, you know, I, I like to, there's one track. It's not one of the tracks that's been released yet, but you'll hear it on Friday if you check out the album, which I use just Rototoms, no Toms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can hear them and, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what was I going to say? And those, the awesome thing about Rototoms, I think, I think my biggest one might be, it's either 14 or 16. But it sounds like an 18 because you can put the mic underneath it right in the middle of the head. Mm. 
and it's such a full, deep, crazy sound. It sounds like an electronic drum. It's like, it sounds awesome. I love it. <laughs> I mean, I think people forget that, like, the reason we mic the side of a drum head, I mean, not the side, but, you know, the rim, is because you're, you're going to hit it if not. Yeah, yeah, right. That's why we put it there. Yeah. It's not because... It's the best spot, yeah. <laughs> it's, not the, you know, it's like, if, 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 you put, if you put a mic inside a kick drum, you don't put it to the edge, like, by the shell pointing in. Like, what? No. It's because you're going to hit it. Yeah, right. So, it, like, it blows my mind when I see people mic rotor toms on the top. Like, what are you doing? Mm, you're missing. You're missing tip. the. You're missing the entire point. I mean, think about miking like like a guitar amp. Moving the the mic from the middle of the cone to the edge changes the sound. Huge, yeah. It's a, it's a big decision. So if you can put it in the middle, why not? Now, do you put those yeah. rotor toms on a separate stand, or do you have them on that bulky ass <laughs> big like all four on one thing? So so what I do is they, because I I use them. I use them instead of toms, right? So I'll have, a, like, if we're doing, like, a rototom day with Baroness, I, I get rid of the toms, and I still have the rototom. So what I have to do is, the rototoms, st the stands that come with the smaller, the three-piece yeah, rototom yeah. set, the stand is really high, because it's meant to go sort of above your hi-hat. Right. Right? So, so I need it to go lower. So what I have to do is I have to take out the top part of the rototom stand and use a clamp to clamp it on a cymbal stand oh, without, okay. without the cymbals on it. That way it can go low enough that I can play it like a floor tom. Uh -huh. And then I have, so when I do that, I have, once again, I'm lefty, so I'm doing everything backwards. But I think on Zoom, it might look the right way around. <laughs> I don't know. So I just have the, the two high toms here and the two rototoms two high rototoms here and the two lower rototoms where the floor tom would be. And it's really ergonomic. And that's the other thing. They're smaller and you can put them right up next to each other. So you can just go up and down really fast. Mm. It's awesome. Do they detune on you? I have trouble with them detuning. They do. They do detune. But they're so, you just crank them. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> that's all you have to do. First of all, there's one head, which makes it not twice as easy. It makes it eight times, <laughs> right? right? Cause there's no, it, there's no interplay. And then second of all, you like, if you tighten it, like it, it'll start, you know, tightening where the majority of the tension rods are. And then there'll be one that's loose. You can hear it and just tighten that one mm. and you're done. You know? So yeah, they're, they're incredibly easy to tune and incredibly easy to mic up. They sound weak acoustically, which is why I think people don't use them. Mm -hmm. But when you put them through a PA with a nice mic or on tape, they sound huge. Do you tour with them? I used to a Trans Am out there. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to ask you about the stacks. Is that a Terry oh, Bozio yeah. influence as well? Because here's why I ask. I think of when I think of stacks, I think of you, John Theodore, and Zach Hill kind of making the stack a sound in the late 90s? I think, honestly... They all got it from you? Like, Is that what we're going? I, 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 John, John's a really good friend of mine. That's why and I asked. Came, I, yeah, I, I we, assumed. I think he might have gotten it from me. <laughs> I don't know. John, I love you. I think he might have gotten it from me because we toured a lot together before he was in the Mars whole time. Um... I, I I don't think I got it from Terry Bosio. I think I was just like peripherally aware of that. I don't think it was a conscious thing. I mean, maybe I got it un subconsciously, not unconsciously. Yeah. Subconsciously. Um, I think I was just like I said, I was just bored. And I just wanted I just wanted something that didn't sustain as much. Because there's something, something you know, a symbol with a nice sustain, we all appreciate it. But there's something kind of classy and sweet about that. And I was like, I don't want to be classy. Mm. I want to be abrasive and, and different. Mm -hmm. And also, I had a lot of broken symbols. Like, right. Yeah, right. What are you and, doing? And, yeah. and, and, and couldn't afford new symbols. So. Uh, man, now I got to look at my list of questions here. What did I forget? Oh, what is your touring rig? Is it the same kit? The touring rig, it changes a little bit. 
honestly, one thing that changes depending on what we're doing is whether or not I bring the 18. Because I really like the 18 for like dramatic moments, but I don't, I realize I don't play it that often. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's like if we have like a smaller trailer or smaller, or we're playing smaller venues, I'm like, you know what? I'll, I'll just, I'll just play the 16. It's fine. I mean, the kit looks cooler with the 18, but sometimes space is a bit, you know, harder to come by. Um, the other decision is whether I bring the 22 or 24. And that's just like a taste thing for me. You know, the, the 22 I feel is easier to tune because ironically, as you know, all you got, you tune the 22 lower than you tune the 24. When you first learn that, you're like, <laughs> right yeah yeah but, yeah because uh, a 24 if you go tune it low it's like sub sub frequencies right you can't even it, is. it just it just sounds like a floppy oh, yeah. bo box or something but uh yeah so if i want to sound more sort of ian pace john bottom i'll bring the 24 and tune it high if i want to sound more contemporary by contemporary i mean 80s <laughs> <laughs> i'll bring the 22 and tune it down it's just sometimes you just get tired of something and you do something else. And there is on this, the 22. It's a mix. It makes the drum kit a slightly more ergonomic because the mm -hmm. toms can sit a little lower, but it's just, it's two inches. It's not a big deal. Now you Baroness is getting ready to go on the road for a bit, right? Starting yeah. up here soon. So are you prepping? Are you practicing? Are you waiting till the band gets together? How do you get your body so, ready for that? We, so starting with COVID, I actually, for the first time in my life, became disciplined about practicing mm. by myself, which I, I'm really way into now. And I wish I had been more disciplined. I always practiced, but it was like, I was just kind of like haphazard about it. But now I really enjoy it. So the first job now is to relearn these songs that we recorded three years ago and right. I haven't played since. Luckily, there's nothing. There's nothing like too crazy. Like I, I'm, I'm pretty much there. So we learned that, and then this week we do an in-store tour, and that means that Nick and I don't play. John and Gina do acoustic oh, okay. sets, and Nick and I just go to we just go and hang out and sign records and we talk to the fans and do like a Q and A. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's just a you know like a week on the East Coast, and then we have a couple of weeks off, and that's when we start rehearsing for real. And uh, and then the tour starts October 13th. So we have a month exactly to get ready. So, yeah, so we'll, we'll probably have like three, like three day sessions of practicing because we like to sort of uh, annoyingly, we like to have, if we're playing like 12 songs a night, we have like probably 24 songs prepared because mm -hmm. John really likes to switch it out. Which I understand the attraction of that, but I also sometimes like to play the same set like four nights in a row, so you can really hone in on the transitions and stuff like that. And it's also a little it's a little nerve wracking when you're on tour and you've prepared 24 songs, and those you haven't played one of those songs for three weeks. Oh yeah, right. And then it shows up on the set list, and you're like, "What? Yeah." <laughs> and then you gotta listen to the record you're like, on your pad. You're like, "I don't remember what the hell I did here," right? That's a little nerve wracking. So, so we try to like if we if we're, if we're re adding a song we haven't played in a while, we try to play it during sound check. Uh -huh. But yeah, so we'll have a couple of sessions in Philly and New York. The four of us relearning the stuff, and yeah, I think I think it'll, I think it's gonna be great. I'm I'm excited. Do you do like full production rehearsals, or is it just get in the basement and jam kind of a vibe? getting the basement and jam uh, when we go to Europe? We, we rent the back line. So that's like a, a little bit of more production because our sound guy, we're, we're also renting a board sometimes. Mm -hmm. So while we're, while we're uh, rehearsing, he'll be learning all his stuff, you know, and, and if we rented lights or whatever, we mess with that. So that's a little bit more combination. But here we just, we just get in the basement. Love it. You know, we're at the end of the hour, and I forgot to ask you about publicists. Is that project still happening? Okay, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you the quick rundown on that. So, for people who don't know, 
I also like techno and house music, underground, weird versions of that, not the cheesy stuff. And I have a project where I combine that with drums. And the studio versions are just drum machines. I could I, I love I love drum machines. I've always loved drum machines. Love programming drum machines. I don't consider them competition for drums. It's like a different instrument. Mm -hmm. But um so what I did, I, I used to play along to my program and sequence stuff with with an acoustic drum kit in the middle of the dance floor in a in a in a dance club, in a nightclub. And that was cool, but I I didn't I thought it sounded too acoustic. Mm -hmm. so I was in my rehearsal space about like four months ago and there's maybe 40 rooms in there and there's a corner where with trash and i'm going to the bathroom and i walk past the trash cans and somebody had thrown out an entire electronic drum kit like an elisa's pad what? kit <laughs> and i and i saw it and i was like i know exactly what happened here the brain broke uh... and they and they think the whole thing is useless and i picked it up immediately brought it to my space plugged in my brains that i have and everything works <laughs> I mean, it's 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 on the lower end of the, of that, but so the new the new way I do it now, I have my electronic kit, and I have a sample rack, so I have my own samples of classic drum machines that I like, and then I have one of those tabletop looper things, uh -huh. and I I import my own bass lines and chord progressions, and I have a click and I play along to it, and I also have some drum machine stuff playing through the looper. So it's a combination of program drums and me playing live and I can loop my vocals with effects and I can loop what I'm playing and layer it. So it's like this really crazy combination of program drums and program synths with live electronic drums and live electronic loop drums and vocals. Awesome. And it's, it's incredibly fun to play. I have to say. Is that like something you work on in the hotel late at night or between tours? No, or... no, I, 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 do, I do that at home. Okay. For sure. When I'm, when I'm in Baroness World, I'm in Baroness. And the, the, the good thing about that is that, you know, it'll be like maybe like a month and a half of Baroness. By the time it's over, I, I'll have like a, a real urge to work on the electronic stuff because I haven't touched it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like that. I think it's cool to like put something aside for, for a minute and, get, and actually get excited about it when you go back to it. Instead yeah. of feeling like... Go ahead, sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was done. And it, it, instead of just feeling like it's a chore. Do you deliberately book a show so you have to prepare something, or are you just happy to do it? I anymore? haven't played a publicist show in years, and I'm I'm gonna do. I'm gonna try to book a show soon. Yeah, and that's that's exactly right. You have to. If you don't book a show or a recording session, you're gonna just constantly, especially if it's a solo project. Mm -hmm. You're just constantly gonna be like, oh, I can make it a little bit better. Oh, let me change this baseline. And you can do that for years and years and years. Is there so, a yeah. club in New York that's kind of your home base for this? There's a club called Good Room, which is in my neighborhood in Greenpoint in Brooklyn. And Good Room is cool because, you know, on the spectrum of clubs, you can have clubs that are like really cheesy, like Manhattan, like guys that work in banks, you know. And then you can have clubs that are like a complete, like dingy, like dungeon with like one strobe light. And yeah. a fog machine, right? <laughs> and 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 good room is like somewhere in the middle. Okay. Like, like like it's if it sounds good, there's some lights, you know, there's attractive people, but it's not cheesy. It's not like it's like people you actually want to hang out with and, and uh -huh. friends you want to actually know. It's not like it's not like Wall Street people or or yuppies or whatever. Take it. I'm sorry if there's anyone. <laughs> I think everyone listening can relate. <laughs> okay. Well, I have one final question. It's what I ask every guest whenever I remember. You might have probably already answered it, but what was your first snare drum? So my first, I remember my first drum kit. Okay. What happened, so I was in Argentina, I was in Buenos Aires, and our guitarist played in his church band. He didn't go to my high school. He went to, he was a friend of my neighbors, long story. Anyway, he managed to borrow the kit from his church which was, and it was an Argentine brand, and I forgot what it was called, but the two rack toms were the same size. <laughs> and it was, it had a white wrap on it, and it was like particle board or something. Yeah. I don't remember the name, the name of the brand, but that was my first snare. And when I say borrowed, I mean, we never, 
return. <laughs> was it a so, metal snare or was it like a cheap wood snare? I think it was wood. I think it was oh, a cheap wood snare. It sounded great. <laughs> sounded like shit. And then I remember, and then when we came back to America, my first proper kit I got was a Tama Rockstar. Of course. Yeah. I got for Christmas. And I still remember that, that wood varnish smell when you open it up. You're like, that'd be the best thing ever. Now, was that when it was only available in black and white and red, I think? I mean, mine, mine was black, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I used that on a lot of early trans and It sounded awesome. Yeah, they're great drums. I wish I was that was That was power toms. It is time for a lesson. This is part two of Odd Time Fluency series. This time we are going to be incorporating the bass drum into our 446, 644, and 464 groupings in 7 8 time. Quick recap we are working in 7 8, which means we have 14 16th notes to work with, which is why it's most commonly um, grouped into fours and sixes. And we're starting with four sixteenths plus four sixteenths plus six sixteenths, and those sixes are grouped in two groups of three. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to replace the last note of each grouping with the bass drum. So it'll be three with the hands, one with the foot for the fours, and then two with the hands, one with the foot for the two groups of three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, Now, once you have the basic pattern between the snare drum and bass drum comfortable, I would mess with orchestration. I'm going to do one that goes from snare drum to rack tom to floor tom. So it's a three drum cycle, which means the first bar will start on the snare, second bar it'll start on the rack tom, third bar it starts on the floor tom, and then for the fourth bar you're back to the snare drum. And that just creates this kind of, kind of odd over the bar line feel, but it's just the same grouping moved clockwise around the kit. So here's what that sounds like. Alright, next let's reverse where the bass drum is. So instead of ending the grouping with the bass drum, we're going to start each grouping with the bass drum. So for the fours, it'll be bass and then three hands. And then for the six, it'll be bass, hand, hand, bass, hand, hand. Five, six, seven, one, two, three, four. And here's what that sounds like when you apply that same three drum cycle, snare, rack, floor, in a four bar phrase. All right, this time we're going to play two notes with the bass drum. So for the fours, it'll be hand, hand, kick, kick. And then for the six, it'll be hand, kick, kick, hand, kick, kick. Five, six, seven, one, two, three, four. Now here's that moving around the drums clockwise. Now let's reverse it. So it'll be kick, kick, hand, hand for the fours, and then kick, kick, hand, kick, kick, hand for the six. Five, six, seven, one, two, three. And here's how that sounds like when you move it around the kit. Now let's mess with the order of our groupings. So instead of it being four, four, six, we're going to do six, four, four. Same thing, we're going to do three with the hands, one with the foot for the fours, two with the hands, one with the foot for the six. So it'll be six plus four plus four. Five, six, seven, one, two, three. And here's what that sounds like moving around the kit. Now let's reverse it so the bass drum starts. So for the fours, it'll be kick, hand, hand, hand. And then for the six, it'll be kick, hand, hand, kick, hand, hand. Five, six, seven, one, two, three, four. And here's what that sounds like when you move it around the kit. Five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, 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 five, six, seven, one,
let's do the doubles. So for the fours, it'll be kick, kick, hand, hand. And then for the six, it'll be kick, kick, hand, kick, kick, hand. Again, we're doing six plus four plus four. Five, six, seven, one, two, three, four. Let's move that around the three drums. Five, six, seven, one, two, three, four. Let's do our third grouping option, which will put the six in between the two groups of four. So it'll be four plus six plus four. And we're gonna go back to three with the hand, one with the foot for the fours, and then two with the hands, one with the foot for the two groups of three. Five, six, seven, one, two, three, four. Move that around the kit. Five, six, seven. We'll traverse it. So kick hand, hand, hand for the four, and then kick hand, hand for the two groups of three. Again, four plus six plus four. Five, six, seven, one, two, three, four. Move that around the drums. Let's do the doubles. So it'll be two with the hands, two with the foot for the fours, and then one with the hand, two with the foot for the threes. Four plus six plus four. Five, six, seven, one, two, three, four. That around the drums. Now let's reverse it. So the fours are kick, kick, hand, hand, and the sixes are kick, kick, hand, kick, kick, hand. Four plus six plus four. Five, six, seven, one, two, three. Moving that around the drums. So that should give you some ideas to mess with. There's a lot of technical practice to do there and then just getting used to hearing that three note grouping around the drums. That's one option. You can combine any of these. You can do them in succession. Um, the whole point is to get used to hearing seven, eight in the more of a flowing fashion, incorporating the bass drum crossing over the bar line, anything to get you out of having to repeat your ideas every seven eighth notes. So hope you had fun with this. Let me know if you have any questions and we'll see you next time. This is another question from Alex following up on last week about snare wires and bottom heads. This question is, does wire material or other features actually make a discernible difference in a musical setting? Or, and does getting high quality wires matter more than the material type? This is a great question. I did a lot of comparisons. Um, I think maybe even earlier episode, I compared all the pure sounds and all the DFD wires. Um, what I discovered is there's a difference but it's not that significant. I think the biggest difference you'll hear is if you go from a really small, like 12 strand strainer to a 42, you're gonna just hear more snare sound, the obvious thing. Um, th when you're talking about snappy wires that are in the middle 20, 25, 30, I mean, it's discernible. Does it make a huge difference? Not really. For me, it's more about what is the drum giving back to me? Do I want, is it giving me too much buzz or is it not giving me enough buzz? Is it, is it, the, the ratio of snare response to shell tone out of balance, or is it perfectly matched to where the shell tone and the length of the snare buzz kind of die down together? That's what I'm looking for. What I don't want is to hit a drum and the snares kind of hit and die out, but then the shell keeps ringing. Or the opposite, the, you know, the snare is just buzzing constantly. So yes, there's a discernible difference when you're talking about number of wires. Material, I've compared them, a lot of them, brass, um, stainless steel, steel, um, coat chromed brass all those again the variations of a snappy wire kind of sound the same you some would be slightly brighter or darker than others but kind of the same it's when you get into like cable 
like guitar strings and different like wax coated versions of snares, you're going to hear a difference with those. But you're talking about just general snappy snares. The material, I don't think is as big as import, important as what I think is the most important is the end clips and how the, the wires are soldered onto those end clips. That can make a huge difference. If there's only one solder point on those wires, then they're going to eventually pop off the end clip. Whereas if there's two or three or more, it's just going to be more durable wires. So the quality of the manufacturing ends up being a little bit more important in the long run than what they're made of, what they look like and all of that. So just look for a good quality end clip. The DFD wires are great. The pure sound wires are great. I'm sure there are other options. Canopus, they're all, they're all high quality. Um, so you'll just, you know, some of them are heavier than others, but my experience, find a number of wires that you like, find the end clip that has the right weight and, and right size that makes your drum respond the best. And then from there, you just kind of experiment and try different flavors. But um, honestly, a 1422, 20 strand wire is gonna work on almost every drum, um, regardless if it's brass or copper or bronze or stainless steel. So that's my two cents. We'll probably dive more into shooting out like a blindfold test of wires later but I wouldn't get too freaked out about it. Find one that works for you and stick with it. That's it for this week's episode. As always, thank you for your support. I appreciate you listening. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you hit us with a review and a five-star rating. If you haven't done that already, if you have, thank you so much. Um, mark your calendar, January 23rd, the first drum hang, drums and stuff over at Hawthorne Drum Shop with DFD, PAS, Drum Candy Podcast, and Hawthorne. And David Throckmorton is our first clinician. And we'll see you there. It's free. I don't know if I mentioned that earlier. Completely free. And we'll have some food and beverages and some, some giveaways and some swag. And you can go shopping at the store as well. So January 23rd, 6 to 9 at Hawthorne Drum Shop. See you there. Until then, have a great week. Play some drums. Go listen to some Baroness. Um, tweak your snare drum a little bit. And we'll see you next time.